state of, state of Texas. Tell them, Lord. Please be seated. We'll hear argument in three cases this morning. Uh, first is 19872, the Herman Health System against Gomez from the from Harris County and the First Court of Appeals District. Justice Bland is not participating in that case. The next is uh, 2639, Eddie Engler Energy versus Bluestone Natural Resources from Tarrant County and the Second Court of Appeals District. Uh, and finally, 2725, and Dolan versus the City of San Antonio from Bear County and the Fourth Court of Appeals District. The court has allotted 20 minutes per side in each case, and we'll take a brief recess uh, between the arguments. The arguments are being webcast live this morning and will be available in the archives uh, later on our website. Justice Lehrman cannot be present this morning but expects to participate in the decisions of all three cases. We're ready for argument in 19872, Memorial Herman versus Gomez. May it please the court, Ms. Pfeiffer will present argument for the petitioner. The petitioner has reserved five minutes to the May it please the court. The $6 million judgment before the court awards identical damages to a doctor for defamation and to his physician association entity for business disparagement. Yet there is no evidence of a viable defamatory statement, there's no evidence of causation, and there's no evidence of an injury. There's a lot in this case that we could talk about today, but I'd like to try to touch on those three points. First, that the quoted statements in the jury charge are the only ones that can be properly reviewed, and they both lead to a very easy path to rendition. Second, that the expert's causation opinion is conclusory, and there is a glaring failure to exclude plausible alternative causes. And third, that the lost mo profits model is likewise conclusory, and there is no separate evidence of any reputational harm. So first, starting with the quoted statements, we've put those in the bench exhibits at tabs B and C, so the court has them handy. Defamation cases have to be pleaded with particularity. They have to be proved with specifics. It's kind of like a fraud case. You need to know who, what, when, to whom. There's all sorts of details that you need to be able to try and, and prove a defamation case. And where a plaintiff identifies a statement and submits a quoted statement in the jury charge, the courts must review the statement as quoted. That is our basic position. If the court agrees with that, both of these statements fail because as quoted, they cannot support a defamation claim. The Todd statement at tab B was not repeated to anybody that would connect to the damages model. The whole premise of this case is that there was a decline in CV surgical volume that was caused by a loss of referrals, and so the plaintiffs needed to show that some defamation actually reached a referring physician. And this statement at tab B, the, what we call the Todd statement, was made by an employee of Memorial Harmon to an employee of Methodist West who repeated it to the CEO during the hiring process, and they decided to hire Dr. Gomez, and that's where that ended. So it does not connect to any of the damages that have been alleged in this case. The second statement, what the plaintiffs call the Ozine statement, is a statement from Brian Ozine, a Memorial Permanent employee, to Dr. Gomez and was not repeated to any other person. This quoted statement was solely repeated to the plaintiff, which fails on the element of publication to third parties. So the plaintiffs in the Court of Appeals tried to reimagine and reinterpret these statements, and that's how the appellate court affirmed the judgment, is that they reimagined these statements as something far more amorphous to represent either circulating rumors or use of data. And those concepts cannot be reviewed by an appellate court because you can't test it against all the elements of defamation. Wasn't the jury confused about the Ozine statement as reflected by the question that they asked the trial court? Yes, I think they were, and they, they saw the issue that if it's only repeated to Dr. Gomez, it's, it doesn't go anywhere. 
And so why weren't they given more information in response to that question? Why wasn't the jury given additional information at that point? Well, there was a debate on the record with Judge Moore about what the jury should be instructed. And we said, Judge, it's the quoted statement. And he said, well, if I instruct them that, I'm directing a verdict. <laughs> and we said, right. I mean, the, the quoted statement does not support defamation, but he, he could not well, there reinterpret are two, the Well, there are two statements in the quote. There's the statement that he's making, and then the statement that he's shown at the cardiologist at cardiology meetings so they can make informed decisions. So what do we do with that? Well, there's nothing that can be done with that because the plaintiffs didn't have anything more specific underlying this quoted statement. <laughs> Just as Busby, if you look at tab B in the bench exhibits, behind the quoted Aussie statement, there's a slide that shows all the unanswered questions that if we're trying to unpack this statement as somehow the statement within the statement, we don't know anything about it. We don't know what was shown, what data we're talking about. We don't know when. We don't know to whom it's shown. We don't know from this statement whether it was <coughs> whether Ozzy was saying that he was showing it inside a privileged meeting or outside of these meetings, and that's that's actually really important. Did you object to the jury charge on that ground? No, because there's nothing objectionable about the form of the jury charge. So, Why? If, if you read it to be talking about the statement within the statement. Well, because as a quoted statement, that is the statement that's being asked for findings. And so, to be clear, we had been objecting since before trial that you can't have some vague, amorphous concept submitted to the jury. That's at tab D of the bench exhibits, and you can see since pre-trial, we've been standing up in court saying we need to know what the defamatory statements are, and the judge agreed. He said they have to be specifically listed in the jury charge, and at tab D, it shows the limine rulings where the judge agreed and granted our limine point before trial that only evidence that is tied to specifics could be admissible for, for defamation or could be argued to be defamatory. So it had to identify a speaker and what they're saying and what, when it happened and to who. We needed all of these specifics because in a case with a hospital, there's lots of people within a hospital that are not Memorial Hermann employees. And so the plaintiffs needed to be able to attribute it to somebody who was a Memorial Hermann agent or employee. And we needed to know specifically what we're talking about and when. Is, and there, is there a case that says if those specifics are not in the jury charge itself, but are supported by the evidence that's not enough? I don't know that there's a case specific to the jury charge issue, but there's certainly cases, lots of cases, that talk about you need the specifics in the evidence. So they don't have the specifics in the evidence. That's the whole point. The reason they don't have a more specific statement for the jury charge is because they don't have the evidence to have quoted it. And at tabs E and F, this is a very important point that I don't think the Court of Appeals fully appreciated. All the data in this record was shared in statutorily privileged meetings. That was the whole mandamus proceeding that went up to this court in this case several years ago, where the court held that this privileged material was discoverable in this case because of the anti-competitive action. There's an exception where you can get privileged materials for antitrust claims. So they had privileged materials in this trial, but that could not be used to support defamation or business disparagement without getting separate findings to overcome the statutory immunities. So the plaintiffs were trying to find something that happened outside of a privileged context. They quote this statement by Brian Ozzie to Dr. Gomez out in the hall because that's not a privileged meeting. And that is the statement the jury made findings about. Turning to causation, regardless of how the court views the charge, there is no evidence of causation. And we've put a lot of the testimony into the bench exhibits so the court has handy the specific testimony that we're looking at in tabs, the last four tabs of the bench exhibits. This case fails for all sorts of reasons. Part of it is the equal inference rule. But the, the premise of the case from the plaintiff's perspective is that these people within the hospital had to know that Dr. Gomez had high mortalities because data was being shared outside of a privileged context. That doesn't work because mortalities are common knowledge within a hospital. And so there were lots of ways that people would find out that there are deaths 
And the evidence, if you look at the timing of it, and the timeline at Tab A is actually really, I think, helpful in showing that people had concerns about this CV surgical program having high mortalities before the data initiative. It was early 2009 when this Todd call allegedly happened to Pena, when she was saying there's concerns here. It was early 2009 when Brian Ozing was hired, and his first priority when he was hired was to look at the cardiologist's concerns that there had been high mortalities in the CV surgical program. And so that is why they started looking at this. They sent the, all the doctor's cases out for peer review. Then they started this data initiative to start looking at the mortalities and the rates and see what could they do to improve the mortalities. So there is no reason to infer that anybody would have come to an opinion that Dr. Gomez had high mortalities based on anything about the data when they could have learned this simply from being in the hospital knowing that their patients were dying. This case makes it very much like the Hancock versus Varian case, this court's doctor defamation case from a few years ago, where there's just, there are multiple inferences that can be drawn, none more plausible than the other, and so you can't draw the inference that the plaintiffs are asking to be drawn. Same with Marshall Field Store's case. It's a case about rumors within a store that couldn't be attributed to defamation because it had been common knowledge. And so when rumors arise because of common knowledge, you cannot infer that defamation caused that knowledge. I also want to touch on the, the plausible alternative causes. This court discusses this issue a lot. I mean, the Houston Unlimited case is a, a great example. This comes up a lot in this court's jurisprudence. Um, and, and it's such a glaring error in this record that I think it's a, a very easy issue for the court to deal with. The premise of Dr. Gomez's case, again, is that because his CV surgical volume was declining over time, starting in 2005, four years before the alleged defamation, because it was declining over time, he wanted the jury to infer that that had to be, because of defamation, reaching his referring doctors and causing a loss of referrals. And Memorial Hermann introduced evidence of three different explanations for why CG, CV surgical volume would decline over time. One, because of medical advances, where less invasive techniques like stents and balloons were being used instead of the high-risk CV surgeries. That was a known national trend that was undisputed in this record. Another is that when Dr. Gomez resigned his privileges at Memorial Hermann and went to Methodist and limited his practice solely to one hospital, that causes a decline because all the doctors agree that they typically would refer patients to surgeons within their own campus. They try to keep it in-house. And so when you resign privileges at one hospital and move hospitals, you're going to lose the established referral base that you had from the prior hospital. And finally, he had a vein practice. And so in 2005, his practice, his CV surgical practice started declining, again, before the defamation because he was devoting time to this side business. And then he wanted to say, well, after the defamation in 2009, it continued to decline, but he, he didn't want to account for the Vane Institute where he worked from noon to six every day. So he has this thriving side business that was growing over the same span of years. It was growing into a million dollar business and his experts did not account for that at all, that his afternoons were completely consumed with the side practice. So, as the defendant, our job is just to introduce evidence of plausible alternative reasons why his CV surgical volume would be declining over time. The plaintiffs then have the burden to exclude that. And the experts just gave this the back of the hand. They, they can't just give it the back of the hand. They have to actually reason through this and explain why that would or would not impact their analysis, and they just didn't. So, the damages expert testified not one dollar was deducted for any of these alternative reasons why the CV surgical volume would be on a declining trend. For a legal sufficiency, uh, do they have to exclude the alternative reasons if there were legally sufficient evidence that the defamation was the cause? So, for example, if you had, if he had brought several referring doctors who testified, I quit referring to him because I was told the 
this bad information about him. And that was on the record, no, no dispute about that. Then he wouldn't also have to negate the alternative he uh, would, uh, reasons, or your position is he would still have to negate the alternative reasons for purposes of a legal sufficiency review. You still would have to address the alternative reasons and exclude them with reasonable certainty. And it, your question raises a good point. To be clear about this record, there was no cardiologist who ever said, I've stopped my referring to Dr. Gomez or that this had any effect. They, nobody had ever heard any defamation with any specificity. There was only testimony from a couple of people who said they'd heard it first. But nobody said they changed the referral patterns. They all said we'd still refer to them. But even if he did have that testimony, I do think this court's jurisprudence says you would still have to address plausible alternative causes because they could have some impact, right? So even if they aren't sole cause, they could have some impact that you have to account for in coming up with the damage model. And finally, turning briefly to the damage model, the, the easiest, cleanest point here is that the expert admits she has to use a discount rate and she uses a risk-free discount rate of 2%. That's the U.S. Treasury bond discount rate. That is, is totally conclusory when you're talking about a physician's solo practice. And it makes this case very much like the Southwestern Energy versus Berry Health End case where there was just a flawed input without any basis that infected the entire damage model and made it no evidence. Does that also affect the 205 procedures damage model? Yes. And, and to be clear, because I saw that there was an argument in the briefing that we hadn't challenged that, we did challenge all the damage models with a Daubert motion. That goes to the cherry picking point, that's the reliability challenge, but this point about the discount rate is a legal sufficiency challenge about the conclusory input that is multiplied, the discount rate is multiplied by the entire model, and we challenge that with a JNB. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Pfeiffer. Thank you. We'll hear from the respondent. May it please the court, Mr. Lee will present argument for the respondents. <coughs> May it please the court. This case is about the clash of two separate kinds of interests. Memorial Hermann's administration had an interest in retaining Dr. Gomez's patient base when it learned that Dr. Gomez was going to expand his practice to Methodist West. On the other hand, Dr. Gomez had an interest in delivering patient care to his patients and was doing that when he was the victim of a patterned campaign of defamation. The thing that the court needs to keep in mind is that we are talking about an administrative action by Memorial Hermann to create a metric that measures surgical quality and every expert that testified, including Memorial Hermann's experts, testified that the metric was invalid and inaccurate. It didn't show the quality of care. It statistically didn't work. The metric is the individual surgeon's mortality index. And when you hear or read statements about how Dr. Gomez had high rates of mortality, that's what it is based upon, is a statistical analysis of mortality data that Memorial Hermann itself created. But it's an inaccurate analysis, and Memorial Hermann ultimately knows that. The reason that we know that Memorial Hermann knows that that measure is inaccurate is that the first cycle of information in this case, which runs from 2009 to early 2010, culminates with a doctor whose name is Rick No, the NGO. Dr. No is the head of the peer review process that commits analysis of the cardiovascular surgeons would be 
being subjected to. Dr. No is brought in by the Memorial Hermann administration, specifically by Keith Alexander, who's the CEO, and by Brian Alzine, who's the gentleman who actually hates this metric, to review information that Memorial Hermann has gathered on all of the cardiovascular uh, uh, surgeons. And when you, when you say that information was inaccurate, uh, you don't mean that they miscounted. No, I found So the data, the data was what was what it was. The raw data is what it is. And this is a pretty savvy crowd. So why didn't they realize? Well, sure, that's what that says, but that doesn't have anything to do with this interview. Uh, if we're talking about uh, the administration, uh, Mr. Alexander and Alzine, it's Dr. Gomez's position is that they have in, they intentionally use the metric in order to make Dr. Gomez look worse, in order to cut down on his referrals, and thereby eliminate the possibility that he takes patients from Memorial Hermann to Methodist West. Let's talk, though, for a moment about what's wrong with the data, um, because it's not as easy as it seems. It is true everybody knows what the raw numbers are. This particular metric is based upon a different sort of calculation that's done by the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. The, uh, the STS is, is how you'll see that referred to in the briefs and in the record. Uh, the STS measure measures mortalities that are caused by not surgical misadventures, just bad results from surgeries. But the SDS measure doesn't do it on a doctor-by-doctor doctor basis. It does it on a facility-by-facility facility basis, and well, it's To that point, um, I understand that all of the data that were circulated, so even giving the questions and the charge the broadest reading possible, as this Court of Appeals seemed to have done, um, how can they be defamatory if they don't identify Gomez? First, Gomez was identified by name uh, in several specific instances. Dr. Gibson, who's the chief medical officer and also to Dr. Gomez's partner, comes to Dr. Gomez in late 2009 and tells Dr. Gomez, I hear that Memorial Hermann has information on you that you're a bad surgeon, excess mortalities, you are going to be proctored or suspended. And for a cardiovascular surgeon to have any one of those things happen to him, that's the kiss of death to your career if you're a surgeon who's got proctored uh, or suspended. So Gibson knew who it was. He'd heard from somebody that Dr. Gomez had a quality of care uh, problem. Additionally, at the testimony from Dr. Berman, this is sequentially later in the entire uh, proceeding, in the entire timeline, I'm sorry, in the, in the proceeding. Dr. Burton and Dr. Berman, who's a cardiologist, testified that he, Dr. Berman, knew Dr. Gomez, so Dr. Berman didn't induce his referrals because of the, what, we, what has been labeled the whisper campaign, but Dr. Berman testified that other cardiologists did. They heard that Dr. Gomez basically was a bad surgeon and had altered their referral patterns. And there is there. So, so do you mean that there is evidence in the record that the recipients of these uh, spreadsheets with the data being insiders would have been able to decipher that these, which of these worst mortality rates related to Gomez? Is this, yes, is we're, we're talking about four uh, cardiovascular surgeons. So it's a small universe to begin with. When this court heard the mandamus, uh, Justice Willis, speaking for the court, said, wrote, that the mere fact that the information is not is de-identified doesn't mean that witnesses or jurors 
aren't going to be able to figure out who is the who are the problem surgeons. In the final meeting, there's a second cycle uh, of this entire progression. Dr. Gomez is specifically and quietly identified by Dr. Macris in a meeting in which there are a large number of doctors, both surgeons and cardiologists. And Dr. Macris, upon hearing Dr. Gomez's complaints that you're using the bad data again, Dr. Macris uh, says something to the effect of, well, the only people that have to worry about that are the ones that are red flag surgeons. And Dr. Gomez's testimony is that it was clear that that communicated to everybody in that particular uh, meeting who was being talked about. But there's a, but uh, there is other evidence in the record in addition to that specific instance. And I think it's the other evidence that really is more probative. When you have Berman talking about it's generally known, it's in the air, the referring doctors have heard it and they're reacting to it because they're different than me, speaking of Dr. Berman, because they don't know Dr. Gomez. And it's a relatively small community, small number of uh, people involved. And there's just lots of information that's leaking out about Dr. Gomez. Let's get back to, uh, to the mortality index itself, because the you know, Chief Justice says, okay, if these are smart people, why didn't they realize what's going on? There's really two answers to that. One is they're smart people, but statistically they're not especially sophisticated. Brian Ozine, who's the one who created the metric, his background to the extent that it's related at all is he has studied radiology. He's got a business degree. He is by admission not a data analyst person and not a statistician. The problem with the measure that they created is first, the sample size is much too small for it to be meaningful. With the STS data, you're looking at larger numbers of doctors because you're looking at facilities and comparing other facilities. When you look at individual doctors and try to correlate their individual mortalities, you never end up with a big enough, uh, you know, a big enough number of subjects to be able to generalize from. Anything you can say based on that sample isn't statistically significant. It's not showing a relationship. This is not something that is necessarily going to be clear to people that don't have the background. But it is clear to people like Barry Hinton, who was the quality expert that Mark hired. And it's clear to Rachel Goethaken, who was the who was a witness called by Dr. Gomez, who ran the STS program that did the STS measure. And they both said, statistically, this doesn't do you any, any good at all. It is simply not a valid measure because the sample size is too small. It's also not a valid measure because when Memorial Hermann did it, they aggregate different kinds of procedures in order to get enough deaths to talk about. But if you're aggregating different kinds of procedures, you are not doing the same thing that the SDS does, which is looking at specific kinds of surgeries and comparing the specific kinds of surgeries. Why is that important? That's important because if you're just looking at a given kind of surgery, you can, and you've got a large enough subject group, you can risk adjust the, the data. If you aren't looking at one type of operation on a large enough basis, you can't risk adjust the data. And the fact is, and everybody knows this, but statistically it becomes important when you start mixing apples and oranges. The mortality rate that you have for any given sur surgery is going to depend an awful lot on the health of the person who's being operated on. And you can tell that if you use the SDS data, and you can adjust it so that the fact that once a group of surgeons are treating people who are more 
put have greater morbidity uh, than normal, then they're going to get worse results. But it doesn't mean anything in terms of their effectiveness as surgeons. They're just working off people who are older, or people who are smokers, or you know, what have you. Some don't get through the surgeries as well as others, and you can adjust for that as long as you don't aggregate all the data. Memorial Hermann aggregates all the data, and so admittedly, although they say that the data is risk-adjusted, when they ask, they say, well, no, actually, it's not. You can't risk-adjust it because of the way that we did it. The third thing that's a problem with this particular metric is it doesn't measure quality of care. That's not what it was intended to do when the STS set it, set it up. It's intended to show large tendencies uh, within institutions. But when Memorial Hermit uses it, the intent is to separate good surgeons from bad surgeons. And this just won't do it at all. All right. That was a lot on statistics. I apologize to the court uh, for not sort of like statistics personally. Um, for that digression, what's important about that is that in early 2010, we've got Memorial Hermann reporting that we've got four cardiovascular surgeons, two of whom appear to be the primary drivers of excess mortalities in the cardiovascular surgery unit. And we just talked about why we can't come to that conclusion based on that data. What happens then is Dr. Go, remember the gentleman who's in charge of peer review, takes over the inquiry. Uh, he says, I'm, you know, this data is not risk adjusted. I don't think it is really telling us anything. What you need to do when you're talking about surgical quality is what we normally do, which is peer review. So the peer review committee takes the four surgeons, looks at several years' worth of cases. <coughs> and does a comprehensive peer review on all four of them to see if there is a quality of care problem with any of them. It takes months. It takes four months. Uh, during the process of going through this analysis, Dr. Ngo, Dr. Ngo uh, comes to the conclusion that, for some reason, the administration seems to be trying to do an end around the peer review. Uh, the peer review committee, when they look at, at the information and do a case-by-case -case peer review, conclude there is no problem with quality of care, that everybody is doing okay, all four of them. There is some room for improvement, but there is absolutely, Dr. No testified or characterized it as a resounding exoneration of Gomez and the other three cardiovascular surgeons from any suggestion that there is a mortality problem. And the peer review committee, speaking through Dr. Ngo, told the administration that this is not useful data. We don't want you continuing to generate this data. We don't think that it's proper. And in fact, Dr. No testifies that if you were to spread non-risk adjusted mortality data about a surgeon that reflected badly on him, that would be atrocious because that so clearly misrepresents the situation. I'd like to run out of time, and I feel like I'm hearing you argue a completely different case than we just heard the petitioner's counsel argue. I mean, I think what they're saying is even assuming all that's true and that the reliance on raw data is bad and that uh, it can be misrepresenting the actual Number. Their argument is, yeah, but in this record, there's no evidence that any statement that was relying on the falsity of that data was ever communicated to anyone in any way that ever caused your client damages, a, lot, a loss of referrals. And I feel like y'all are arguing two completely different cases. There are some, I don't mean to cut you off. There are some, in some senses, there are two separate narrative uh, narrative paths that are occurring in this litigation. And Memorial Hermann's narrative path is that we have this data initiative, we're trying to improve uh, uh, surgeon care, and it's all benign. Uh, Plaintiff's narrative path is there is a reason why this data is being 
it's beef problems. I don't think they're saying it's benign. I think they're saying no one ever communicated it to anybody in any way that caused the loss of the food. We know that that's not true because yes. because uh, Brian Ozzie, because of the Aussie statement to begin with. Brian Ozzie tells Dr. which was made to Dr. Gomez. Yes, tells Dr. Gomez. So where's the evidence that then it went from Gomez in some way to someone else? that caused the loss of referrals. Because what he's telling Gomez is, I have told the, cardi the cardiologists, I have gotten the data to them, because they need to see it to make so the referrals. So there's a statement within a statement. Yes, yeah. Okay. And there, there's no, uh, I don't mean to seem dismissive about this, but there is no problem with the form of the charge at all. The jury understood what was being talked about, and you know that for sure, when you look at the jury question, because as, as Justice Bozeman pointed out, uh, the jury asked, are you asking us about that statement from a literal, literal standpoint, or are you asking us about the information that he says he was giving uh, to somebody else? Words to that effect. So the jury got it. That there's a statement within a statement, and the jury was decide was trying to get some guidance as to what do we look at, and of course, as is typical when you have that kind of a problem, uh, the trial court tells the jury essentially, you know, look at the charge, do the best you can. But what they end up deciding is that we are quickly because otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Uh, we are making an evaluation of was the statement that Gomez had high mortality, the Tawazin admits statements, admits that he's made, um, were they defamatory? So and, even if you're right about all the flaws in the metric that, that you were discussing, do you also have to show that the speakers agreed with you that the metric was unreliable and then made the statements anyway? Is, no, it, so uh, is it this about their state of mind, and if so, what's the... The evidence there. Uh, the state of mind can uh, can be only recklessness. In this set of circumstances, though, because you have the peer review analysis and a specific instruction from the peer review uh, folks who got the note to stop using the data, um, they do have mens rea. They know that it's bad if they were under any impression prior to. They, they know other people think it's bad. Do, do, they, do they agree that it's bad, or, or is that not the standard? It's, uh, it is certainly, it, it's not the standard in a defamation case that the person making the defamatory statement has to agree that it's defamatory. What is... But it has to know that it's false, right? Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and we do know that they knew if at no other point in time after that peer review analysis was made of the very same data that had been subjected to uh, the individual surgical mortality index, I'm sorry, individual surgical mortality data, and the peer review committee had told them specifically, we don't want to be using this data. This is the appropriate way to evaluate medical care. Uh, it's just not fair to the surgeons. And the testimony goes somewhat further uh, than that. I think I might be over rather basically. You can finish your talk. <laughs> uh, the testimony goes somewhat further than that because the person who's running that peer review uh, specifically testifies that he felt that what was happening is that the administration was deliberately manipulating the data in order that Dr. Gomez be treated differently than he would be treated if he was, if he was given an objective analysis of the kind of care that, had been, uh, that he had been provided. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Lee. Ms. Pfeiffer, I'm going to be at five minutes. May it please the court. Justice Boyd, you accurately characterized our position, and we did not hear any answers. We are, we are ships 
uh, crossing in the night. And the, the challenge we have in this case is that we just heard a lot about statistics and data. And standing here today, I don't know what data we're talking about. Because we're talking about years worth of data in this record that changed over time. Um, Justice Huddle, you asked about it being blinded, and I've included two examples of data in the bench exhibits that both show blinded data. I've got the first um, data presentation that was ever presented and one of the last data presentations. They're very different. They're blinded, and everything you heard from Mr. Lee today is about data that was presented in privileged meetings. He's referring to statements made and data presented in these statutorily privileged meetings, which is why this is not what's in the jury charge. They were trying to find something outside of a privileged meeting to put in the jury charge to overcome our objections. And, and Justice Busby, if I could return to your question about objections to the charge, we all agree the charge doesn't have any form problems. We had a 12-hour informal charge conference with four board-certified appellate lawyers including the trial judge, the plaintiff's lawyer, and two lawyers on the defense side. And the trial judge rewrote your question, right? That's how we ended up with this? No, no. This question was the party's agreement. At 15, volume 15 of the reported record, page 8, Judge Moore, during the jury deliberations, when the jury's asking about what does this Aussie statement mean, he recalls the parties, the lawyers agreed to this statement. They agreed to go back to the quoted testimony. And the reason the plaintiffs were willing to do that is because if they didn't have something specific, we had all sorts of objections. We had limitations. We have the privilege issue. We've got the fact that all through trial, Judge Moore had been saying, you need to identify a speaker and specifics. And so this was their way to overcome all of our objections in this 12-hour informal charge conference. This is what they came up with. But don't we have to interpret it possible to charge question and the jury finding to avoid nonsensical results and in a manner that upholds the judgment? That, that, that proposition comes from cases where jury charges are ambiguous. And you nobody... The jury seemed to think that this one was ambiguous. The jury may have thought that, but that, I think the parties agree and the court can look at it and say it's not ambiguous. Now, it's legally insufficient and, and fatal on its face, but it's not ambiguous. So... I, you know, the, the fact that the plaintiffs put something in the jury charge that just doesn't work is because that's all they have. They didn't have something more specific to put into the charge. This case reminds me a lot of the court's recent decision in Burbage versus Burbage, where it's a defamation case, and the plaintiff was trying to prove that defamation caused customers to cancel contracts. And they were asked, well, did you ever ask any of your customers why they canceled the contract? And they said no. They didn't actually go do anything to confirm that defamation caused the harm. Dr. Gomez, is, he knows who his referring surgeons or referring cardiologists are. He could have gone and asked any number of them, do you, have you changed your referral patterns and is it because of hearing any data? And he had zero evidence on that. And everybody that we asked as the defendant, we asked that question and got, positive answers in our favor, saying, no, they haven't changed the referral patterns. So it's very much like the court's decision in Burbage versus Burbage, in Hancock versus Merriam, um, and in Brady. The, these cases say the harm has to be more than theoretical, and you actually have to show that defamation reached listeners who not only believed it, but changed their opinions based on the defamation. The plaintiffs just don't have that. This case has been a lot like trying to nail Jello to a wall. We don't know what the defamatory statements are if they're not what's in the jury charge. And we can't defend ourselves if we don't have specifics. That's, Judge Moore agreed with that, and that's why at the beginning of this case, he was telling the plaintiffs, you've got to have specifics. It can't just be a whisper campaign. It can't just be rumors. We have to know what the statements are. And so I submit the only way to review a case like this, a $6 million defamation and business disparagement judgment, is to review the statements of the charge and hold them legally insufficient. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Pfeiffer. The case is submitted and the court will take a recess. All rise.